telling you about this uh, all last hour. Uh, Staff Sergeant Sal Junta is now, you see the, him sitting there with President Obama at the White House, going to receive the Medal of Honor. This is a guy who back in 2007 was in Afghanistan, caught in a firefight. And uh, he was a, a hero, a true hero that day, going in to save a wounded comrade. Uh, let's listen in to the ceremony. May we all recommit ourselves to sacrificial and selfless service for our families and our fellow citizens. Cause our reflection on the Holy Union forged among soldiers during combat to inspire renewed unity in our own land, especially during times of crisis and conflict. As we celebrate this special day with Sal's wife, Jen, his parents, Stephen and Rosemary, his brother, Mario, his sister, Katie, may we remember in prayer all military families who await the safe return home of their loved ones. And finally, as we pause to remember the many freedoms we enjoy as a nation, let us never to give thanks more than we do right now to those especially who paid the glorious liberty with which we enjoy through their very blood, sweat, and tears. This we pray in your holy name. Amen. Good afternoon, everybody. Please uh, be seated. Uh, on behalf of Michelle and myself, welcome to the White House. And thank you, Chaplain Carver, for uh, that beautiful invocation. Of all the privileges that come with serving as President of the United States, I have none greater uh, than serving as Commander-in-Chief of the finest military that the world has ever known. And of all the military decorations that a president and a nation can bestow, there is none higher than the Medal of Honor. Now, today is particularly special. Since the end of the Vietnam War, the Medal of Honor has been awarded nine times for conspicuous gallantry in an ongoing or recent conflict. And sadly, our nation has been unable to present this decoration to the recipients themselves because each gave his life, his last full measure of devotion for our country. Indeed, as president, I've presented the Medal of Honor three times, and each time to the families of a fallen hero. Today, therefore, marks the first time in nearly 40 years that the recipient of the Medal of Honor for an ongoing conflict has been able to come to the White House and accept this recognition in person. It is my privilege to present our nation's highest military decoration, the Medal of Honor, to a soldier as humble as he is heroic, Staff Sergeant Salvatore A. Junta. Now, I'm going to go off script here for a second uh, and just say, I really like this guy. Um, uh, I think anybody, you know, we all just get a sense of people and who they are. And when you meet uh, Sal and you meet his family, uh, you are just absolutely convinced that this is uh, what America is all about. Uh, and it just makes you proud. And so uh, this is a joyous occasion for me, uh, something that uh, I've been looking forward to. You know, the Medal of Honor reflects uh, the gratitude of an entire nation. So we are also joined here today by several members of Congress, uh, including both senators and several representatives from Staff Sergeant Junta's home state of Iowa. Uh, we are also joined by leaders from across my administration and the Department of Defense, including uh, the Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen. Where's Mike? There he is right there. Uh, Army Secretary John McHugh, and Chief of Staff of the Army, General George Casey. We are especially honored to be joined by Staff Sergeant Junta's fellow soldiers, his teammates and brothers from Battle Company, second of the 503rd of the 173rd Airborne Brigade, and several members of that rarest of fraternities that now welcomes him 
into its ranks, the Medal of Honor Society. Please give them a big round of applause. We also welcome the friends and family who made Staff Sergeant Junta into the man that he is, including his lovely wife, Jenny, and his parents, Stephen and Rosemary, uh, as well as his siblings who are here. Uh, it was his mother, after all, who uh, apparently taught him as a young boy in small town Iowa how to remove the screen from his bedroom window in case of fire. What she didn't know was that by teaching, teaching Sal how to jump from his bedroom and sneaking off in the dead of night, she was unleashing a future paratrooper uh, who would one day fight in the rugged mountains of Afghanistan 7,000 miles away. Now, during the first of his, tour, uh, his two tours of duty in Afghanistan, Staff Sergeant Junta was forced early on to come to terms with the loss of comrades and friends. His team leader at the time gave him a piece of advice. You just try, you just got to try to do everything you can when it's your time to do it. You just got to try to do everything you can when it's your time to do it. Uh, Salvatore Junta's uh, time came on October 25th, 2007. He was a specialist then, uh, just 22 years old. Sal and his platoon were several days into a mission uh, in the Korangal Valley, the most dangerous valley in northeast Afghanistan. The moon was full. The light it cast was enough to travel by without using their night vision goggles. With heavy gear on their backs and air support overhead, they made their way single file down a rocky ridge crest along terrain so steep that sliding was sometimes easier than walking. They hadn't traveled a quarter mile before the silence was shattered. It was an ambush so close that the cracks of the guns and the whiz of the bullets were simultaneous. Tracer fire hammered the ridge at hundreds of rounds per minute. More cell said later than the stars in the sky. The Apache gunships above saw it all, but couldn't engage with the enemy so close to our soldiers. The next platoon heard the shooting, but were too far away to join the fight in time. And the two lead men were hit by enemy fire and knocked down instantly. When the third was struck in the helmet and fell to the ground, Sal charged headlong into the wall of bullets to pull him to safety behind what little cover there was. As he did, Sal was hit twice one round slamming into his body armor, the other shattering a weapon slung across his back. They were pinned down, and two wounded Americans still lay up ahead. So Sal and his comrades regrouped and counterattacked. They threw grenade, uh, grenades, using the explosions as cover to run forward, shooting at the muzzle flashes still erupting from the trees. Then they did it again, and again, throwing grenades charging ahead. Finally, they reached one of their men. He'd been shot twice in the leg, but he had kept returning fire until his gun jammed. As another soldier tended to his wounds, Sal sprinted ahead at every step meeting relentless enemy fire with his own. He crested a hill alone with no cover but the dust kicked up by the storm of bullets still biting into the ground. There he saw a chilling sight the silhouettes of two insurgents carrying the other wounded American away, who happened to be one of Sal's best friends. Sal never broke stride. He leapt forward, he took aim, he killed one of the insurgents and wounded the other, who ran off. Sal found his friend alive, but badly wounded. Sal had saved him from the enemy, now he had to try to save his life. Even as bullets impacted all around him, Sal grabbed his friend by the vest and dragged him to cover. For nearly half an hour, Sal worked to stop the bleeding and help his friend breathe until the medevac arrived to lift the wounded from the ridge. 
American gunships worked to clear the enemy from the hills. And with the battle over, 1st platoon picked up their gear and resumed their march through the valley. They continued their mission. It had been as intense and violent a firefight as any soldier will experience. By the time it was finished, every member of 1st platoon had shrapnel or a bullet hole in their gear. Five were wounded and two gave their lives. Sal's friend, Sergeant Joshua C. Brennan, and the platoon medic, Specialist Hugo V. Mendoza. Now, the parents of Joshua and Hugo uh, are here today. Uh, and I know that there are no words that even three years later can ease the ache in your hearts or repay the debt that America owes to you. But on behalf of a grateful nation, let me express profound thanks to your son's service and their sacrifice. And uh, could uh, the parents of, of Joshua and Hugo please uh, stand briefly?